and welcome to the Faith and Works podcast brought to you by the Interfaith Leadership Council of Detroit. The goal of this group is to bring together, encourage, and nurture interfaith groups and networks to support conciliation between and among religious groups as well as the community at large through active conflict resolution and to promote interfaith education so that the metropolitan Detroit community can benefit from the synergies and creative benefits that knowledge and understanding can provide. My name is Maddie Sosa, and I will be this episode's host. We have three guests with us today. Robert Bertel is currently the vice chair of the Interfaith Leadership Council. He is an adjunct professor at University of Detroit Mercy, where he teaches history in the Religious Studies Department. The courses he teaches focus on American pluralism and America's social ethics. Welcome, Bob. Good morning, Maddie. Our next guest is Saeed Khan. When he's not at Wayne State University, where he's senior lecturer in Near East and Asian Studies and Global Studies, Saeed Khan is usually on some plane heading to some time zone, researching how religion interacts with the modern world and how the modern world affects religion. Welcome, Saeed. Thanks for having me. And our final guest is Reverend Robert Jones. Robert Jones is an award-winning roots musician and storyteller and has served as the pastor of the Sweet Kingdom Missionary Baptist Church of Detroit, Michigan for over 16 years. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So we're glad to have you all here. It's great to be here. (laughs) So to start things off, I wanted to give each of you a chance to talk a little bit about what you think this podcast has to offer and why you wanted to be a part of this particular project. And maybe we'll start with Bob. Well, thanks, Maddie. Uh, this podcast is uh, has a long time in being born, and uh, this morning becomes the first time that we're able to actually uh, try to put some things out there that we've been thinking about for a long time. Uh, the idea of, of faith and works has a long history in uh, the idea of religion itself. It certainly uh, probably even uh, was introduced before the uh, Reformation, but it's certainly been around for 500 years. And we want to advance that idea in uh, in the, the current period where we think that both uh, – Faith and the idea of what comes from faith are uh, being questioned by a lot of people, um, and we think that that there's something to be said for a robust discussion that uh, deals with questions that religion has always been concerned with, but for some reason during our time, uh, people are saying that religion may be irrelevant. And for many people, especially in America, where religion has been uh, the way Americans think, as a matter of fact, uh, American intellectual thought and American religious thought are possibly indistinguishable. Uh, Although in our current time, maybe people are trying to uh, distinguish them more than they did in the past. But uh, Religion is becoming something different, and it always has been becoming something different in America. And so we want to explore that question about what religion is becoming. Uh, It's always in some sort of transition that is, uh, to those who are adherents of uh, particular religions, may look like religion is dying. Uh, That has not ever been the case in America, and it is my uh, assumption that it's not the case now, though we may be looking at religion in the future that looks quite different than what it has in the past. So uh, here we are at another sort of inflection point um, where people are saying that religion is becoming less of something and there's less participation in what we would call the mainline religions. Uh, we have uh, lots of religious identity that comes from the, uh, the immigration that's been uh, very prevalent since 1965 and the new uh, immigration laws that were put into effect in 1965. And so uh, that's the, the, the purpose of this exploration will be to, to look at what, uh, what religion is becoming uh, how it relates to the current society and uh, what we might learn from that uh, that uh, transition that it uh, that we believe it's uh, in the midst of. Great, as you can tell, there's going to be a lot of great episodes. We've got a lot of meat. We have a lot of meat for this. 
All right, Saeed, would you like to talk a little bit about why you want to be involved in this podcast and, and what you feel it has to offer? Well, I think, first of all, uh, I want to be involved because of the people who are involved. Uh, I've, I've known uh, Bob for several years, and uh, in many ways, I think the podcast will probably be a platform uh, for conversations that we've been having for all of those years and, uh, and looking forward uh, to having the good reverend on, on uh, and in those conversations as well. I mean, to me, I, I always take a look as a historian uh, on the role of religion and what it has meant uh, for shaping societies. And I think for a long time, religion has been what has regulated and dictated societies. Now, it seems as though the tables are turned and it seems as though society is now dictating and regulating what are the parameters of religion. I mean, we're we're looking at religion now through terms like market share, uh, monetization, valuation of religion. Not and, to mention social media as well. And social media and the irony of us uh, using a podcast to talk about these things is not lost. <laughs> but but how then are we reaching a uh, – the intended goal of religion which is to create functional society? Mm. Uh is it about societies becoming less functional? And if that's the case, do we point to religion as being the cause of that? Uh, and if religion isn't the cause, what is the cause of that? And equally importantly, that can a dysfunctional society uh, then have a harmful effect on religion? So these kinds of interactions uh, fascinate me. It's one of the reasons that – when I travel, uh, I'm always keen to see how that dynamic is uh, working somewhere else. Uh, but there's no place to really start that's better than the local. And so here in the Metro Detroit area, I think we have a really vibrant uh, religious community scene. How the interactions uh, then affect religion and society both in an explicit way – but also perhaps more uh, interestingly in the implicit ways. Wow, that's great. That's great. Uh, Reverend Jones, how about for you? Well, certainly uh, Bob and Saeed have said a great deal, and I'm excited about the possibility of discussions with these two as well as with others um, as we continue in this podcast. But I think what really uh, interests me is the fact that uh, religion at various times, and I speak, you know, I can speak primarily to the idea of Christianity and Christianity in the African American tradition, um, has been this powerful entity that brings about social change, that brings, allows people to collectively, uh, fight for principles of justice, um, to pull together to build schools and hospitals and really affect change to fight discrimination, segregation um, in the society that we live in. Uh, Dr. King was a preacher. Dred Scott was a preacher. Um, so I wonder about a time where now uh, the church seems to be losing its steam, its vitality, and its focus mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, why is the church not the same radical and transformative uh, entity that it has always been. Um, you know, when, when you read the uh, New Testament, folks talk about uh, the word as being uh, something that is really revolutionary and um, in a sense dangerous, right? So as we become seemingly more complacent um, with our religious backgrounds, we also see an uptake on this idea that I am not my brother's keeper. We see mass shootings. We see, uh, you know, this sort of runaway um, hedonism or individuality, not in the sense of being individually expressive, but in the sense of just I'm doing my own thing to the exclusion of your thing. And there are no consequences either here or in the future to my actions because I'm allowed to do and be whatever I want to be. So I'm, I'm interested in seeing 
how we got there, and maybe more importantly, how do we get back? That's great. Yeah, and I think that's a, a big theme for us is going to be talking about for future episodes, talking about the past, talking about the present, and talking for the future of the religion in American culture. And so I, I wanted to open that up kind of for a discussion for us now, talking about what do we feel like is the the role of religion in American culture today, in our in our present day landscape? Well, I think that Religion's role today is the same as it always has been. Um, it hasn't really uh, changed. What's changing is some of the context in which religion uh, operates. Uh, <clears throat> there's a – there has always been syncretism in religion. That is the idea that when you have all of these different cultural uh, religious identities bumping up against one another, they uh, they influence each other mm. and they form one another. And so that's actually one of the things that we want to explore and to explore here is what uh, what is happening with that syncretism today? What's being informed by that? There's some, just to give you an idea of, uh, of a simple way to understand syncretism and religion is to say that when uh, Hindus or Sikhs or Muslims were in the, um, in the parts of the world where those religions uh, were very prevalent before they came to the United States, they had no need for Sunday school. And so – they then come into the United States where the Protestant religions have had Sunday school forever and lo and behold, they seem to need Sunday school. Mm. And not only do they need Sunday school, but their kids then come to Sunday school and they don't eat their traditional foods. They eat pizza and donuts, <laughs> right? That's syncretism. That's what's – so uh, uh, you can take that on to, you know, away from donuts and take it into the – social media platforms that are so available and so those are influencing religion. So there's a context now where religious um, identities, religious traditions are then being both assessed by the context that they're living in and they're also assessing that context. They're saying this is good about that and this is not good about it. Uh, those of us, anyone who's ever um, talked to uh, an immigrant, uh, first-generation immigrant for any length of time, will almost invariably tell you that America lacks the sense of family that they have within their own religious context, right? They, they feel strongly that they are introducing to America an idea of family that's missing, uh, and of course, part of that is is not just that they're introducing an idea, but there's also a need for strong family networks for people who are new and who do not have an extended network that is you know has been created over the years of just their you know presence in this country. So, so I think that that the that what religions are doing is uh, to 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 go back to to that circle back to it is that they are creating and assessing social ethics. I sometimes call them an incubator. Religious groups are an incubator of social ethics. They take the context that they have always existed in and then they assess the context that, that's current and make some judgments about it. Uh, and it would be an interesting uh, podcast uh, episode to talk about uh, how would you define religion uh, in general. But one of the definitions that I use, which is the one that fits with uh, our works concept very readily, is that religious groups are live arguments for how we should live together. Uh, another way of putting that is that they are uh, dynamic ways that we discuss what should or should not happen in our social context. So I think that's what religion is is doing today, and and uh, you know I think that that's one of the things we want to talk about is what that context is and and what that looks like. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh wow, uh, there's a lot to chew on there. Uh, being a fairly recent immigrant to uh, to the United States, uh, i.e., actually being conscious of my migration, 
uh, some 44 years ago, uh, interestingly enough, from England. Uh, there's a couple things that as I get older, I, I realize about not only on a personal level but also on a historical level what religion means in, in the United States or in the American context. I don't think there's a single person in this country irrespective of their religious tradition that doesn't have – uh, and I'll borrow from Harry Potter here, uh, a Protestant horcrux. Uh, there's a Protestantization. I mean, Bob, when you're talking about even uh, an Islamic Sunday school or a Hindu uh, uh, Sunday school, that is having then on a, an implicit level a Protestantization of Islam or Hinduism, whether they realize it or not. But along with that, it's also having a corporatization of religions. And I think America is really unique in that sense that uh, it came together. First of all, it was born of dislocation. People came to this country dislocated from uh, their other uh, origins. And perhaps that's why, as you said before, the country maybe lacks a sense of family. Mm. You had before the Protestant uh, Reformation, you had one in Christianity – only one game in town, which was the church. And Luther comes around in 1517. Uh, in America, they always talk about Teddy Roosevelt being the great antitrust president. Well, I think that the, the first <laughs> trust buster was Martin Luther, uh, who like then that. who breaks the monopoly <laughs> of the Catholic Church and the kind of deregulation that happens with with uh, Protestantism carries over to become sort of the central ethos for the United States and has shaped everything since. At the same time, uh, it is impossible to be in the United States without recognizing what is the impact of the corporate model on all religions. Mm. And so I'll give you an example. If um, a Muslim community wants to put up a mosque or an Islamic school, the first thing they may do is pray, uh, but they are not going to pray in a facility that they don't have yet. The very first thing that they do is they file their articles of incorporation. They then get here in Michigan a 38 dash number, which they then take and open up a bank account. They then go for the all hallowed, pun intended, 501c3 tax exempt nonprofit status with the IRS. Now, in order to do all that, you have to file bylaws. Mm -hmm. You have to go ahead and file a constitution. Mm -hmm. You have to list your board of directors. Uh, you are corporatizing everything before you've probably even bought the land and lay down a single brick. Now, whether people realize it, that means that all of these religions are getting shoehorned through the gauntlet of a corporate model. So that's going to invariably affect not only their religions, the practice of their religions, religious authority. Is it the board or is it the religious leader? Uh, it's going to affect uh, their identity. And I think that it's important that when we see how religion, as you said before, Bob, as it's going to then affect and shape society, we have to be very uh, conscious of the fact that it is a corporatized model of religion that then is affecting society. And as a result of that, uh, identity, uh, the interaction, the disillusionment that sometimes people have with their religious traditions when it just seems to be too either mechanical or uh, too uh, paperwork oriented. Uh, these are all important topics that I think it's important for us to then see as we move forward and as we're trying to see how does religion occupy a space uh, within somebody's life? Is it a central spot? Uh, is it uh, coming to a religion as a penitent? Uh, or is it coming to a religion as a consumer? I think these are all really important. Yeah. I'm sorry, Reverend Jones, are you about to? Yeah. I mean, we're looking at something that is very much like Saeed said, something that is uh, organizational and corporate, at the same time, you're looking at something that's deeply personal and spiritual, uh, whether you use a big S or a small S. Uh, you know, the church is where you find solace. The church is where you find healing. Uh, the church is often composed of some pretty broken souls. And uh, 
Uh, my pastor used to say, you know, that's the only organization that you can come drunk, crippled, and crazy, and they're <laughs> glad to see you, right? <laughs> so, I mean, the church is that. And um, if you look at a model that says, you know, we're going to choose the best leaders, the most efficient people, the, the, the most organized people, that works everywhere, almost except in the church. We look at the idea of giftedness. We look at the idea of people who are growing within this organization and uh, being, in a sense, shaped by the relationship that they have with the church and then with God as you see God to be. Um, I'm sort of always struck historically. I mean, I'm a roots musician, so I will hear a hymn that's born in slavery. And the, the, the idea being that at the same time that that hymn was being sung by a, a uh, an African-American, uh, a version of that um, song was being sung by the one who had him enslaved or her enslaved. At the same time, you have the great enlightenment and you have all these preachers coming from the north to talk about what will ultimately become a theology that says all men are created equal. You have preachers from the South saying the status quo is fine and God is pleased with slavery. So you have these conflicting messages all the time. And the question becomes, what is the truth? And how do you find the truth? And then, as Saida said, once you get the truth, what do you do with it? Do you sit there and be complacent with things as they are? Do you march? Do you protest? Do you get together and say, our corporation stands boldly for this or against that? Um, and then you, of course, face the risk of losing corporate members. Uh, and then you gain corporate members. All of those things, I think, are, uh, are the things that make the church really unique. It makes it attractive and it makes it frightening at the same time. The fact is that when the Ku Klux Klan would string up someone, they would have a prayer meeting right before because somebody thought he was doing God's will, <laughs> which is, which is amazing, but it's true, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the images we find in birth of a nation are images that um, people are exposed to that they've got to put things back right um, so that God will be pleased. We must make America great again. Well, when did America cease to be great? And we start to ask those questions. And I have friends and acquaintances who have left the church that they belong to for years because of the political stance of that church in relation to the current day politics. And then the, then again, on the other end of the spectrum, you have folks like uh, Dr. King, Dr. Abernathy, uh, and, and, and so many other countless um, uh, leaders in the black church who, in a sense, radicalized the mission and the purpose of the church to bring about rights that I enjoy right now. But um, you know, now they now we have a church that in a lot of places are is that church is largely involved in the idea, okay, we have overcome, so now let's sit down and enjoy the fruits of our victory while there are folks who have not overcome. And we look at folks who are coming into this country with the same a jaundiced eye that folks may have looked at us 60 years ago. Or one of the things my pastor used to say is that in every group, you have three, you have three groups. You have three churches in every church. You have us, you have y'all, and you have them. And we are better than y'all, but both of us are better than them. And, it, <laughs> and the us, the y'all, and the them always, of course, changes depending on who's doing the talking, right? So we have that going on right now. 
Uh, we can communicate with each other because at least we are better than them. But they feel the same way in their circle. And we've got to have some conversation that, that sort of delves into that and, and lets us understand one another uh, on a spiritual basis as well as on a corporate basis. So, uh, Robert, what you, what you say there um, reminds me that one of the things we want to do with this podcast is to not um, treat religion as a, uh, an absolute good, that religion has its serious conflicts, and it always has its serious conflicts because our values are in conflict. I mean, the one you brought up about the, the, uh, some preachers talking about all people being created equal by their creator and others saying that, uh, the, that the place for the, the place that God had intended for certain people was to be enslaved. Uh, you know, that's a, a, a contrast that's, that's huge. But there's, there are these constant, uh, tensions within religion, um, where religion serves all sorts of different purposes. Uh, for one thing, we all could point to certain religious groups and we'd say that if a person wants to, uh, to j- more justify their wealth and their position in society and their s- status, they will belong to this Them. particular religion. And right. that religion will be where they will reinforce their, you know, their status or as a, uh, their economic status. That other religion might be one where they reinforce their political status. Uh, and so we don't want to uh, avoid the really difficult questions in this podcast where uh, uh, I think that, that where religion has become for some, especially in the, uh, you know, in the uh, kind of uh, uh, atheist uh, uh, movement that, that came about in the last uh, 15 or 20 years, where some uh, significant uh, voices were raised about religion. But what those atheists were doing was uh, treating religion as if it was uh, a, a straw man of some sort and that mm-hmm. they could define what it was. And for most of us who are deeply involved in religious practice of one kind or another, we don't recognize the form of religion that they uh, have been a saying that that we espouse. We don't we don't espouse those forms at all. Those are they, they seem childish to us. As a matter of fact, they don't seem real. Well, I think one of the problems that happened is that, I mean, historically, uh, religion would uh, set the parameters for a society's morality. What I think people were caught off guard was that the morality of religion itself became questioned, and so. Once, once you start to question a basic premise, I mean, just to borrow from mathematics, when you have geometry, you are working on a proof. You have to start with certain givens. You start with certain presumptions and you just accept those. Uh, otherwise, there's no way that you can prove anything. Once you start to doubt, question, challenge, indict, uh, and even refute those presumptions, then you are no longer on terra firma. And I think that this is one of the things that's happened with religion is that its very morality is is being questioned. And you then have these alternatives that are being provided where the morality is then being defined, dictated, uh, determined by atheism, uh, now by popular culture, mm. uh, technology, uh, globalization. Uh, all of these forces then are, even if they're not taking a, uh, a direct pot shot at religion and challenging its morality, the very fact that they are now vying for that market share that we were talking about, uh, an alternative, uh, form of, uh, or an alternative mo- a moral compass, uh, that then has caused religion to have to, uh, maybe shake off some cobwebs. And say, wow, uh, we need to then go ahead and move beyond what we simply thought everybody inherently got and, and presumed. And as we see with technology, artificial intelligence, and other aspects coming through, 
the challenge on religion is, as it has been historically the custodian of determining the moral compass, uh, to have to now prove its its relevance. I mean, this is sort of like the uh, uh, the ball player who's the seasoned salty veteran uh, who was never challenged, uh, shows up at training camp every year, and is assumed that uh, he's going to be the quarterback uh, uh, for the season. And all of these young upstarts show up with new techniques of throwing, new techniques of nutrition, new techniques of conditioning. And now we find that the uh, what was one time the blue chip and perhaps the only option for the quarterback is having to now go through and prove uh, that not only should he start, uh, but should still stay on the team. Mm. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I agree that what we're looking at is a time, is a, is a place where the nexus of belief, technology, um, um, social change, wealth, all of those things are coming together to have us ask questions that we've never asked before. Um, let's take the idea of science, that science now allows us to in a sense, um, create families in a way that we had never been able to create families before. Um, the idea of a father and the mother or the, the, the husband and the wife or the male and the female being a necessary unit of some kind to produce a family is not necessarily in many people's minds a given anymore. So what do we do with that, and and how do we deal with that? And I think the technology and the ability to produce these families is outstripping our social convention of how to deal with it. How do we deal with a family that has, you know, just pull it out, say pansexual parents? Who Who's the father? Who's the mother? Who's the responsible person? Who, how does the genealogy run? Uh, you know, who is the inheritor and who is the, you know, who is the, who is the beneficiary? We, we, we don't know these things because now we're able and accepting of things that would have gotten us kicked out of the tribe before. It's like, oh, you know, I, so those are issues. The, the issue that also, I think, comes into play is very much like Saeed saying, how do we determine what is right and what is wrong? Um, there is this kind of saying among folks of, of my children's generation, I do this, does it make me a bad person? What does that mean? Mm. You know, is, is a bad person someone who is critical and is willing to upset the apple cart or to rock the boat? Does that make you a bad person? Or is there a standard that that we are required as humans to live up to that determines that I may not be good? Sometimes you have to be good. Sometimes, sorry, sometimes it's more important to be righteous than to be good. And some of the people who have been trailblazers in terms of our setting the standard of morality have not been good, but they were righteous. To be good is to be, okay, I will follow the rules. Well, if the rules are wrong, then now you must be bad in order to be righteous, to be in in keeping with what God is telling you. Um. That's something I think all of us wrestle with, you know. Um, and I remember when Dr. King was killed. I was, I was very small, but I do remember there were people in the black community, in the, in the religious community, who viewed him as a troublemaker. And in a sense, although I'm sure they didn't celebrate his assassination, thought he was a thorn in the side and was, were kind of glad he, he was gone. Those same people now stand up and celebrate at the altar of Dr. King as if they were 
his biggest fans and we marched arm in arm together <laughs> when there were very relatively few people marching arm in arm with Dr. King when he was you know, saying these provocative things and challenging the American ideal. Well, see, it's about currency, isn't it? That now uh, there's something profitable, whether it is cultural or political or economic, for being seen on Team King. Mm -hmm. And so then everybody wants a piece of the brand name. Uh, and they will go ahead and, and they'll, they'll wear it as a logo or, you know, maybe get a headband with it or, uh, and, 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 and tattoo. well, yeah. And, 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 In a and, tattoo. Yeah. And, and the idea of merchandising rights is, is massive. Uh, I mean, the fact that unfortunately, uh, I think even, even Dr. King, uh, is, is, is subject to copyright laws. Uh, shows then how uh, the economics of, of so much of this drives how we then perceive uh, people and how we define them as either being troublemakers, rabble-rousers, radicals, uh, pariahs. Uh, but when the coast is clear, uh, then people who have less temerity, uh, and less courage, they'll sort of come above ground and say, okay, now the coast is clear. Yeah, we were here the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like kind of like uh, uh, jumping in in the middle of a marathon, uh, or you know, uh, two miles from the end, and act as though you were on the on the course the whole way. Still getting yeah. that medal, medal still, at the end. The medal, yeah. <laughs> Medals all around. Uh, so f for for me, one of the things that that I find uh, difficult to hear is uh, religion being criticized as if it is only about hypocrisy, as if religious groups, as if any group of people have, uh, uh, are, are immune to hypocrisy. And the reason I find that so difficult to hear is because uh, it, it, religion is no more nor no less hip, hypocritical than other places and other ways of being in society. But it also offers the thing over which we as religious people are hypocritical. That is, it offers a challenging uh, set of social ethics that we recognize and we recognize them as being difficult. And we come together to uh, reinforce that those values uh, with those other, you know, with our co-religionists, we come together to to discuss them and to be judged as to whether or not uh, I am living up to those ethics. And so one of the things I want to explore as we do these podcasts is where are those social ethics coming from? Where are those highest and best values going to come from if we abandon the current model of religion? And I assume what we'll find is that we are, have other um, other venues that look that are going to look a lot like religion that we're going to define as religion, and those are going to uh, set those values for us. But I don't think we can live without them, and and I don't think that the uh, that it's fair to just say um, the reason I don't participate in religion is because. Uh, you know, religious folks are hypocritical as if, uh, as if they have some sort of a franchise for that. Well, I think the word franchise, again, is an important one to use. Uh, I don't think, and as, uh, as, as Robert was talking about the, the change of the family structure, uh, away from what used to be seen as a traditional nuclear family, uh, science, and the dynamics of science have, have a lot to do with this. But I, I mean, I think that uh, it's important to recognize that the erosion of the nuclear family predates uh, what, what is seen as popular culture and science. Uh, it starts really with the Industrial Revolution, where uh, extended families, uh, which have been part of many traditional societies for a long time, have to reshuffle themselves. And certainly – Given the migration of people and the dislocation involved to a place like uh, the United States, that notion of tribalism, that no notion of it taking a village uh, to to raise a, a child, uh, was no longer as uh, as presumed of a, of an option. But there's also this 
this idea as you're talking about from where do we derive our social ethics. A lot of that has to do with this public sphere, right? And how the public sphere has changed so much. So historically, it was the church that regulated the public sphere. And then, uh, interestingly enough, uh, after the religion wars of the, the 17th century and the aftermath of the Protestant Reformation, uh, you find that it's the state, the nation state, which then starts to gear with the separation of church and state, um, the, the, the notions of social ethics. What, what is acceptable? You know, universal human rights, uh, uh, civil liberties, et cetera, constitutions deciding these things as opposed to church scripture and doctrine. And now we're entering a different phase where really the public sphere is being regulated by the corporation. So uh, for somebody to be socially conscious, to be socially woke, uh, it's it's a function of uh, which corporation seems to uh, espouse values that are in keeping with yourselves. Uh, is a particular corporation sufficiently uh, LGBTQ uh, friendly? Is a particular co- uh, a corporation sufficiently climate conscious, this is how people are now starting to mold their own quote-unquote religions. Mm. These are the social ethics that are then starting to uh, not only create the lens through which they see the world and in which they interact with society, but from which they then derive, and this is a word I think that we have to always get back to because, well, it's in the title, faith. (laughs) How is it then that faith is reconstructed as a result of the social ethics being now coming not from a church and not from a nation state, but coming from uh, maybe uh, a combination of of corporations? Yeah, when we talk though about the corporation, in a sense, creating the, uh, the the ground rules of the society or creating the ideals of the society, we have to always remember that the corporation is about money. It's about the idea of, of producing a product that people will buy and buy into and feel good about buying into so that that's one of the reasons that we um, look with such scrutiny on a corporation, on a church, on any organization uh, about things that have nothing necessarily to do with their product, but it's the image. It's like, uh, what you know, what is the overall overreaching philosophy of this corporation or this company? And and, and I, I would submit that as long as you're sort of driven by something that is, in a sense, founded in money, then you're going to always be um, affected by that. You know, that is, is uh, to go back to, to, to Jesus, you can't serve two masters, right? So the question becomes, you know, how, how, how much are you going to give to mammon, um, because sometimes the idea of doing the right thing is the idea of giving something away. Of, of there was a, a, I was just at a camp in uh, an adult music camp, and this gentleman from Louisiana told this fairly dr- long, drawn out story, but it had to do with a uh, a chicken and a hog trying to negotiate a price for breakfast, and they end up finally going to a place where it's. 10 cents for all you can eat for a ham and egg breakfast. And the, the, the chicken says, well, that's fine. I can make a contribution. But the hog says, I can't because I got to make a sacrifice. Mm-hmm. So it, it really comes down to those things that you are willing to make a sacrifice toward. Uh, that, to me, is what kind of um, separates us from this idea of the corporation. And, and then... Conversely, we we end up with this idea that if we're going to do the right thing, it's it's it should it not always be the right thing. To go back to Saeed's analogy of the football player, whether the football player is the old grizzled veteran or the young, enhanced, um, uh, you know, ergonomically trained. This, the goal is the same. The goal is to get the ball over the goal line. Mm. 
has the goal changed now um, as we as we play this new game? Is the goal to please God as you see God to be, or is the goal to please your, please yourself, or is the goal to have fun, or is the goal you know, is community the place where I live or is it the place where I type? And ultimately, I can have thousands of friends, but if I need $500 to pay the rent in my house, will that digital or, or, or cyber community come up with the five grand or, or the 500 more readily than my neighbors? Ah, I can do a GoFundMe page, but how often, how long will that last? You know, it's like I've got to paint this picture of my need and my situation so vividly that strangers will say, okay, here. But, and then that gets me past my crisis. But does, does that sustain me more than a community of people whom I love and who love me? Mm. Well, you're also having to deal with how does uh, free agency <laughs> mess with the model uh, when it comes to being able to sustain a common goal. If if you've got this situation where you can just simply leave the franchise uh, uh, and if you have that happening en masse with a bunch of different people, uh, that's going to create multiple disruptions. Well, I think we, we, we have discovered what we thought we might discover before we started this first part, podcast, and that is that we can continue – uh, for quite some time. <laughs> but, I, but I hope that what we've done so far is to uh, give uh, those who will listen to us an idea of what we intend to explore. Uh, I think you can readily see uh, from this whole discussion of corporate uh, w- why one of the things we hear from uh, young people these days is that they want to be spiritual but not religious. And I think by religious they mean that they don't want to be institutional. Mm. And we've certainly mm. got a model of an institutional kind of way of being within uh, church practice uh, in, in a lot of aspects. So uh, with with that idea uh, as kind of a, a last thought, I think that we can leave. Uh, what would uh, where would we go from here, Maddie? I think we just thank our listeners. So thank you for listening in. This has been the Faith and Works podcast, brought to you by the Interfaith Leadership Council of Detroit. To learn more about this organization and the podcast, please visit the Interfaith Leadership Council of Detroit Facebook page and let us know more topics you would want to hear about, things that you want to hear, people you want to hear from, and thank you for listening. <laughs>